we are joined with Mark Schwartz, Dr. Mark Schwartz of Harmony Place, Monterey. We're going to be talking about eating disorders and addiction relapse. A little bit about Mark's background. Uh, he and his co-director, Lori Galprin, MSW, formerly of Masters and Johnson, offer intensive outpatient <laughs> treatment for four hours daily, five days a week, or partial hospitalization for six hours a day, five days a week. They are a one-of-a-kind outpatient alternative to residential care and specifically designed as an intensive three-hour-per-day outpatient program or six hours per day partial hospitalization program. Harmony Place Monterey offers comfortable and serene housing in addition to extraordinary life-changing programming. Welcome, Dr. Mark Schwartz. So thank you very much. Um, thank you all for tuning in. This is kind of fun. So I want to begin by just telling you a story, which is that I started working with eating disorders many years ago. And in doing this work, we followed all of our clients after they left the residential treatment center. And the vast majority of them relapsed. And I realized that relapsing was really part of recovery. But I think most of us in the field feel the same way, which is that whatever we're doing is necessary, but it probably isn't sufficient. And so I began following up the clients after they left, at least a sample of them, and working with them on a weekly basis, as many of you do. I realized that they really had almost no anticipatory guidance of what recovery consisted of. And so I started doing research and tried to find somebody who would map out the recovery to give them anticipatory guidance. And lo and behold, I didn't find anybody there. So I began to kind of empirically document by listening to my clients, writing down what they were enduring, and looking at my interventions. And that's really what the talk's about today. I want to tell you the story, which was the very first client that I saw, I did some incredible work with. She was primarily anorexic, uh, needed refeeding, and was really interested in dying. And after a period of time of working with her, we did refeeding, and I did a lot of work in therapy. I did family work with her, and so on. And we were ready to discharge her, and she looked at me, and she said, you know, Mark, I... I can't live in the world. And I said, why not? And she said, you really don't get it, do you? And I said, get yeah, what? She said, I, I've lived all, all my life with my mother. My mother's done everything for me. And I just don't know how to live in the world. I don't know how to live with people. I don't know how to take care of myself. And I said, well, you know, you're in college. You're smart. Everyone likes you. You know, you'll learn how to take care of yourself. And, you know, what like that don't you know how to do? And she'd say, well, like, I don't know how to pay my bills. I don't know how to write checks. I said, well, I can teach you how to pay your bills and write checks. And she looked at me and she said, you really don't get it. And her words haunted me because I, I'm not recovering from eating disorder. And, you know, there is an advantage. It sort of takes one to know one. But I, I'm a good study, and so in the next 10 years, I've tried to figure out what she meant, and I think she was right. I, I don't think I got it. Because eating disorder is not about refeeding. It's not about stopping binging and purging. It's not about um, overeating. Those are symptoms. And it's the first stage of treatment is any addiction is to get the symptom under control relatively. But the symptom will come back unless you look at the underlying disorder and plot out a map of recovery. So that's my talk today. I want to talk to you about what I've learned subsequent to that. This concept called executive function. Because what happened is I would give my clients assignments. Like I'd be in a group and I'd say, everyone would say, I'm lonely and that's why I lapse. And I'd say, well, okay, you're all lonely. You're all wonderful people. Exchange phone numbers with each other and let's get together this weekend. And then the next group, they'd come back and they'd all say, 
I'm lonely. And they didn't get together this weekend. And so, you know, what I found is they wouldn't follow through. And it was mysterious to me because most of my clients, when we gave them assignments, followed through on them. So, you know, I screamed and yelled. And so then they exchanged phone numbers and they called each other. And they got together and they were still lonely when they were together. And I realized that, you know, it was sort of like it, when I used to do endocrinology, there was a hormone and it would bind to a receptor site. And it was like the hormone was there, but it wasn't binding to the receptor site. So a person was there, but they weren't able to connect in some deep sort of way. And I contrast that. I saw a client yesterday who was suffering from anorexia and really was almost died and she's recovered successfully. And she said, you know, I decided to cut back from work because I was in a French class and I, I made such good friends there that I want to keep them. And so I'm, pay, I'm taking time each week to meet with these people and have relationships with them. I just love them and I love being with them. And I thought to myself, wow, you know, what a change. The question always is, what is it that you do that, you know, turns the corner and makes a difference? I know we all ask those questions. So. I'm trying to look at those things structurally and identify them. So as I looked at this, I began to look back at my basics, which was, you know, most of us understand what are executive functions. Executive functions are these functions that, you know, we look at from the central nervous system um, when people have great difficulties with skills and operating in the world. I'm just going to read a couple of them to you and see if they sound familiar to you with your eating disorder clients. Emotional control, the ability to modulate emotional responses and bring rational thought to bear on feelings. Or initiation, the ability to begin a task or activity or to independently generate ideas or problem-solving strategies. Or planning an organization, the ability to manage current and future-oriented tasks. One of my clients was in university and uh, she has been in it for an infinite number of years without graduating. And finally, the teacher said to her, you know, you have to turn this paper to graduate and to get a degree. And so the day went by and she still hadn't turned in the paper, so she wasn't going to get her degree. And, like, why wouldn't she write the paper? She was a brilliant person. But she procrastinated and procrastinated, and she wasn't going to turn in that paper. And so, you know, I had this final session with her where, you know, we had a, a real intense, powerful session, and I got her to stay up all night and write the damn paper. But th the question for the therapist is always, you know, what is it that keeps the person from doing what's necessary, taking that one step? So you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And so often in doing cognitive behavioral therapy, you would do this incredible work and really guide them, and then only to find the client sabotaging in the last minute. And so... I'm back to the drawing board trying to figure out what is it in the brain that seems to be missing or what is it in the fear response that keeps the person from it. And, you know, it's really, you know, I want to say it in sort of summary form, which is that, you know, the client comes in and they're not following their meal plan or they're binging and purging or they're over-exercising or they're lying to you. And, you know, you get frustrated because you're, want to focus on the symptom and you want to be able to help them with the symptom and do relapse prevention and all that business. But, you know, they don't have a job. They don't have anything to do each day. They feel completely out of control. They don't have any friends. They're alone. They're disconnected. And the answer is, you know, they tell you really clearly, like, everything's out of control and the only thing I have any control over is my eating disorder. So, in the end, what I concluded was that there are basically three to four components to all recovery. The first is having some identity, which is you have to know who you are. You have to have a sense of self. And so many of them are 95% eating disorder and, you know, 4.5% self. So that has to change, and you need to have a greater sense of self. So you need to talk about what is self and how to develop it. And how does one establish an identity from adolescence to young adulthood? Number two is forming connections and attachments. How does one go about forming a secure attachment with another human being? Most of you who followed my work over the years 
you know, I've struggled with this for 30 years, and, you know, the only way that I was ever able to make any sense out of it was hanging around Mary Main's work and Bowlby and understanding attachment theory, because in attachment theory, there was this idea of earn secure attachment for people who had disorganized attachment. So at, when I was the director of Castlewood, I took a hundred of our clients and I did the adult attachment interview on them. And not one of them had secure attachment. And so in those hundred clients, what we began to do was work on helping them develop earn secure attachment by decontextualizing the adult attachment interview and beginning to work on specific skills that are embedded in that interview. And what we're able to do is help many of them move towards secure attachment. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how one does that because attachment is necessary for the receptor and the hormone to bind, so to speak, or when the person's with somebody, you feel a sense of connection and to be able to get rid of that lack of loneliness. Okay, identity, attachment, and the third area would be mastery. So often, the individual would feel an inability to be able to problem solve, to carry out tasks, to be able to feel like they can exert some power and control in their life and make a difference. And, you know, in many ways they were spiritually empty where they didn't have a, an idea of what their life was about and their life became be the best anorexic or the life became, you know, being able to follow the rigid rules of obsessive and compulsiveness. And so recovery became, you know, oriented towards around uh, the only thing they would think about would be the obsessive symptom in some way. So what I wrote in this was a slide that says recovery is not just the absence of symptoms. It's the presence of a full life as evidenced by the ability to be human. The truly recovered life reflects spontaneity, freedom, the ability to breathe, to have wants, needs, desires, knowing and believing that the quest for perfection is an unattainable illusion. Having the ability to embrace the feminine, having close intimate relationships, assuming you're a woman, is being aware of tears in your eyes, uh, of subtle sadness, joy, flicker. For many of them, individuals, they didn't know how to play, they didn't know how to have fun, they didn't know how to relax, and if they did, they would feel guilty and feel like they were a bad person if they just had a little bit of pleasure in their lives. So what do you do to help a person be able to experience joy and pleasure? I think the significance of the woman buying the vibrator was not that she just allowed herself to be a sexual being, but that she allowed herself to be able to enjoy herself and feel pleasure. And what a great um, turning point that was for her in some way. Okay, so the other aspect of that symptom was, you know, control of the body. You know, controlling what you take in and what you don't take in is an effort to control the body in some way. And so some aspect of recovery has to include, include being able to feel a sense of one's embodiment and to enjoy what they see when they look in the mirror, obviously. Now, a lot of people have struggled with this concept. Drew Western wrote in the American Journal of Psychiatry a really critical article over the years. And he said, you know, data raises the questions about the extent of which access to is adequate for describing clinically meaningful patterns of personality pathology with women with eating disorders. People with perfectionistic, um, high-functioning cluster um, are, that's certainly character pathology. Our patients are articulate, conscientious, empathetic, and they, they're likable. Yet they clearly have personality pathology, enduring problematic patterns of thought, feeling, motivation, behavior. They are self-critical, they are perfectionistic, they are competitive, they are anxious, they are guilt-ridden, and these parts of the personality deserve clinical attention. Now, let me tell you what that means to me. If you are successful in refeeding somebody and stopping them from binging and purging, you are not effective in your treatment. Now, that's a pretty profound statement because it doesn't give somebody a full life. It just basically gets under control of the symptom. And so many of my clients became alcoholic, they started self-cutting, and a number of them killed themselves. And I, you know, we, we, I would hesitate to call that effective treatment. And so there is symptom substitution for a, for a large number of them. But worse than that, 
They're just miserable, depressed human beings. And so you've taken their symptom away from them without understanding the function and the purpose of the symptom. And I don't like that. So I want to contextualize the symptom. I want to understand, understand what it does for the person. And I want them to be able to experience a full life. And so in Drew Western's idea is I want to deal with the Axis II business as well as the Axis I business. And, you know, we've, in this field, we've, we've become primarily cognitive behavioral with the idea that working on the symptom is enough. You know, for years I treated PTSD. I, my specialty was reading, working with sexual trauma. And, you know, for 15 years, I helped people with PTSD and sexual trauma resolve and feel some uh, resolution of their uh, early trauma in their history. And I thought I was doing good work. But, you know, as I look back upon it at the end of 15 years, what I realized is that treating, treating PTSD is necessary, but it's rarely sufficient. And P treating PTSD is treating the symptom, but it's not about recovery. And so what we need in the next stage of our own evolution as therapists is to understand the whole concept of recovery as separate from symptom control in some ways. So um, in order to be able to do that, we have to first define what our goals are. And people who have been looking at the central nervous system in eating disorder clients, um, a lot of the work has been done on looking at brain pathways. And, you know, some of the people who published on this have talked about, you know, that they have, that the, for example, the anorexic has high harm avoidance as part of their disposition. They lack a central coherence. They have cognitive rigidity. They have need for order and predictability um, and low self-directedness. And all of these symptoms are in the brain and they're probably part of their temperament. So, you know, when people say, well, it's in the brain and part of their temperament, then how are they changeable? And the answer is, you know, those kinds of things can set somebody up for a disorder, but nonetheless, they've got to find a way with their temperament of how to operate in the world. And if they were living on a farm somewhere, socially isolated, they might do fine. But in contemporary society, in complex society, you know, the eating disorder or some other addiction is going to be manifested in some way. And so what happens is, is that this person feels terrified, scared, they become avoidant. And so the primary treatment of eating disorders, you know, was really exposure-based therapies where we work on avoidance and helping the person not avoid that which they're afraid of. It could be white creamy sauces, it could be social anxiety, it could be going to college, it could be taking the new job, uh, a whole variety of things. And, you know, you just do it and uh, do the next right thing is the way the people in the addiction literature talk about it. And, you know, you're a coach that sits there and lays out being able to do it. But I found that even with good psychotherapy and even with having a good relationship, the, most of my clients were so avoidant that they wouldn't just do it. And they, if they did, it would take them seven years to do it. So, you know, the average period of time to get better from an eating disorder. So, yeah, a lot of people do get better, but it just takes too long for them to do it. And what we're interested in is if we can articulate what these components are, and maybe we can get better at being able to do it in some way. So I realized when I dissected it out that eating disorder is indeed an addictive disorder by different definitions of addiction, but it's also a developmental disorder that everything that happens in a person's life affects them. So they have great difficulty with sensory integration, and most of them have some sort of complex PTSD, which then contributes to their anxiety disorder and problems of affect regulation. And then, of course, they have obsessive compulsive disorder, some, some degree of it. But that's why they call it an OCD spectrum disorder. In a Masterson sense, they have a disorder of self, but they also have sexual disorders. Most of them are hyposexual or hypersexual. In the first six months after they left our treatment center, the vast majority of them, their great difficulties was getting in relationship and starting a sex life. And when they do that, it took them right back to their eating disorder. So whatever we're doing wasn't enough in that department. It's an attachment disorder, and clearly it has a major depression behind it that's driving it also. So if you look at the statistics on this, what you find is that of the clients that have been sampled, for example, with anorexia and bulimia, that you'll find that um, uh, a vast majority of them 
significant numbers have OCD, social phobia, specific phobias, general anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, panic disorder, and agoraphobia. So, you know, the real problem with being an eating disorder therapist is you've got to be good with everything. You know, you've got to be good in treating sexual problems, marital problems, family problems, um, and eating disorder, too. And most therapists don't have the skills to be able to do all of it. And so what I find is that, you know, the client would do all this incredible work, but no one would bring the parents in. And no one would do the family work that was essential. And clearly, eating disorder is, in the vast majority of cases, a you know, systemic disorder of the family, and particularly the relationship with the mother and the father, need enormous amount of work and resolution. And, you know, so many programs weren't doing that because the therapists, you know, didn't consider themselves family therapists. So, you know, most of us began to work as teams. But even in that, there's a dilemma. And um, that I found, for example, with the family work, that in a residential center where I would work, that we would do really good family work for maybe a week. And, you know, the, the client would be able to identify, I'm angry at my mother because, I'm angry at my father because, and they'd verbalize it for the first time ever. And then there would be this rift between their mother and them, and a rift between them and their father. And then they would get discharged from treatment, but no one would do work on resolution of those difficulties. And that took much more extensive work. And so as I've begun to follow up with clients, I bring the families back into treatment. And one of the things that I realized is that one of the most critical components of recovery was getting some resolution of the family of origin difficulties. You might say, duh, you know, and, you know, how many years of education did it take you to, to figure that out? Unfortunately, too many. Because what happens is, is that they start out with the agenda, maybe my mother will change, maybe my father will change, and if they change, then everything will be okay. And, of course, that doesn't work. And so what is your goal in family treatment becomes the issue. And what's your issue, what you're trying to be able to do is be able to identify what the problem was and is and how to begin to repair it so the person is someone who, you know, they don't feel alone on this earth, that they feel someone's got their back and someone cares about them and is able to establish some inner peace with, you know, the limitations of parents uh, in the past, present, and the future. And you know, that old Rolling Stones song, you, sometimes you can get what you need and how to be able to make that happen. I remember one family came in to me and they said, you know, Mark, you did some amazing work with my daughter. And it's interesting because I sit here now a year later and I've changed, my wife's changed, our marriage is so much better, our other children have changed, but she's ha still having problems with food. And I thought, wow, that's a good definition of effective treatment. Because as the most differentiated or scapegoated individual begins to change, the whole system changes. When the whole system changes, you know, the eating disorder symptoms may be the last to be able to change. And, you know, of course, when you're in an eating disorder treatment center, your focus of success and failure depends upon the eating disorder symptoms. But if you understand them contextually and you realize that what happened over that year in the family was essential for the eating disorder to change, so when a client is not compliant, it doesn't mean you've got a bad client. It doesn't mean you've got an untreatable client. It means that some way you haven't really looked at the function, the, the systemic aspect of the symptom, and what has to happen in the individual's life and in their system to be able to allow food not to take on such uh, presence in some way. Now, I hope some of you don't think, you know, this guy thinks he's talking to people who... Uh, who are, are beginners, because, you know, I know you know all this, but um, it, if you read the books on treating eating disorder and look at the data and the statistics, it's all about food-related behavior. And you get the impression that, um, that that's the key to being able to treatment. But if you look bigger, what you have to realize is that any addiction, you know, is about not just treating the symptom. And insurance companies push us to be able to say, you know, what is your success rate? And so you have to count, well, the person was drinking and now they're not, therefore it's been a success. But it's by definition a lie, because stopping drinking is not necessarily a success. It's just a component of recovery. And if we could ever get operational about 
what is involved in recovery and the whole kit and caboodle, then maybe we could get more empirical in being able to evaluate this in some ways. I've seen some attempts at this, but uh, I'm not impressed. But part of it is because we've not really defined the components of treatment. You could say, well, isn't it highly variable? One client maybe has a depressive disorder, another maybe have more of a family systemic disorder. There are many different syndromes of anorexia, and there are many different syndromes of compulsive overeating. So don't we need to define, you know, the syndromes that result in this symptom and then give specific treatments for those syndromes? And the answer is absolutely. That's exactly it. That if we could just define, you know, here are the 10 syndromes that we see every day in our office, and here's how we treat each of these 10 syndromes differently, that would be a great gift. And some people have attempted to do that. Um, I've certainly reviewed that literature trying to, you know, do path analysis and figure out what are the common characteristics among these populations. But they haven't really helped me with treatment very much. So, you know, there are components where, you know, certainly perfectionism and body dysmorphia and, you know, body dissatisfaction and such are critical components of almost all of the clients. But, you know, in the end, I come back to these basic components that we've been talking about. Identity, attachment, and a sense of mastery and connection and avoidance. Those four components seem to be present in all the clients that I've worked with over a period of time. So what I did is I said, you know, I'm going to start this new And then in this new program, what I want to do is I want to spend four hours, five hours a day with the client, and I want to work with them not only on skills, but whatever it is that's blocking them from creating a life worth living. And so the first thing I realized was that I was restricted by having them in my office because for many of them, exposure meant you had to leave your office. Now, you know, clearly you've got to take them grocery shopping. You've got to take them to restaurants. You've got to take them to um, try on new clothes. You've got to take them to empty out the old clothes in their closet. Those are things that we've all known for years. But in a more subtle level, sometimes you've got to go to meetup groups with them and help them exchange phone numbers with people. Sometimes you have to um, be able to uh, help them apply for jobs and write the cover letter. Sometimes what you have to do is uh, help them get out to the bonfire on the weekend or whatever it is that, you know, the prom or whatever it is that needs to be done, the wedding, so on, and help them with these kinds of things. Now, obviously, as a male therapist, I'm limited in my ability to do that with a female because, you know, it'll look like an ethical boundary violation. And, you know, it is indeed. Uh, some of the female therapists I work with are able to do more of that. But even then, I think it's pretty controversial that therapists leave their office in that way. And so we began to think about life coaching because we found what we were doing was necessary. So, so much of what I was working on were the blocks that were keeping them from intimacy, the blocks that were keeping them from mastery, the blocks that kept them from, you know, following the meal plan, and looking at how things in their life have affected them. And that was good psychotherapy. But it was necessary, but clearly not sufficient. And then we'd sometimes rely on the dietitian to be able to take them out for meals and such. But the dietitians really didn't have the training to be able to do so many of the exposure activities that were non-food related, nor should they. So beginning to get sober coaches, which was what was happening in the addiction field, made sense. And so eating disorder coaches, you know, are, it, it's a new field, and I began to define it. So what I did is I wrote out what I called the 12 components of life coaching with eating disorder clients. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, relationships was number one. Peer interaction was number two. Sexual interaction, number three. Four, creating passion in your life. Five, emotional regulation. Six, food-related behavior. Seven, occupation. Eight, grieving. Nine, boredom. Ten, assertiveness. Eleven, obsessional thinking. 12, perfection.
perfectionism. 13, safety. 14, trust. 15, personal power. And then under each of those, I wrote out a module where there had to be an educational component where you lay out the actual skills and then have them practice this, like assertiveness. Assertiveness, you know, it's really clear. You can teach people assertiveness skills. You can give them a pretest, a post-test, have them rehearse it in psychodrama, and help people become much more competent with assertiveness. In each of these subcategories, you can begin to do that in an empirically based way, give them a certain number of skills, but in the end, they've got to get out and practice them. And doing it with somebody who's a coach that's with them is probably the easiest and the best way. So many of these things you have to do, you just can't learn them in a classroom. And so in working with people in this transition, so what I did is I created a new phase of treatment. They had residential treatment and then they have outpatient treatment. But something had to come in between, which was a short period of time which is heavily oriented towards giving them skills to be able to live in the world successfully. And, you know, that in this period of time, now that they're under relative control of their addictive behavior, um, being able to find out, you know, my clients, their identity oftentimes are childlike. A lot of them were homeschooled, and so they never learned how to interact with people. A number of them were so, you know, I've got a client now who's, you know, she's, her mom was dying the whole time she was an adolescent, and she and her mom were fused together, and she thought she was going to die, you know, as her mom died. But she just doesn't know how to be in the world. And she clings to her eating disorder because she's just scared to death. And in my office, I've done great work, but she's still terrified to be in the world. There we go again. And so I have her working with a coach twice a week out there in the real world doing these things that not only is she afraid to do, being able to benefit from them. You know. So she asked the question, well, how do you get to the point where you can enjoy being with people and people can enjoy being with you? Well, that's an interesting thing. We can talk about that to we're blue in the face. But if we're, you know, in a group really helps with that too. But in groups, you're still very intellectualizing false self kinds of stuff. But being in the real world with them and watching them and being able to help them in some ways. So, you know, I know it's a little weird. I'm going to take my, my life coach with me to my friend's house. I don't think that's going to quite work. But there is, it is possible you know, to be able to do these meetups with people and be able to watch them in interactions and begin to identify in a behavioral analysis the things they do that work and don't work, and then begin to work with them on being able to feel more open, more trusting, and safe in some ways, and be less terrified. You know, what happens is that the, as long as they have their eating disorder, they seem to be able to bypass, and it numbs them out, and they're able to do things that they're able to do. What happens is that once they give up their eating disorder, they find themselves terrified and overwhelmed of doing even the most basic things that they used to be able to do before. And that's when they have to be able to have you know, the, the power of a coach or somebody with them that can help them with that in some way. So to me, um, it takes a, a reframing. And the reframing is that Instead of the concept of resistance, like my client is being a bad client because they're not following their meal plan, every single thing that a client does is a message to me. It's telling me where I need to work and what I need to do. And so when a client says, look, I'm not following my meal plan, I'm over-exercising, I'm drinking to excess, and I feel like I'm a terrible person and I'm failing, I'm going to get an F in your therapy, it, it's a sign to me that not that they're untreatable, that they need another therapist, but somehow I'm at the point in our progression that maybe sometimes I've done too much, that maybe they're scared to death, maybe they're getting better, and maybe they can't handle it. So I've got to understand what the symptom is, what the function of it is, what message they're trying to send me, and what they need in order to be able to get to the next step in their treatment. And even suicidal impulses oftentimes are signs that they're just scared to death that they're beginning to encounter that which they've avoided for a lifetime. And they're afraid that you're not going to see it and that you're not going to know in some way. And so they're going to reach back to the familiar. One of my colleagues once said to me, you know, you get a good right punch and then, you know, you use that. And then you teach somebody a left punch and then the person gets caught in the corner and 
um, their right punch just comes back because it's more natural, more familiar to them. And I always like that metaphor because, you know, the, the, the restricting and the binging are good right punches. And, you know, what happens even with the majority of my clients who are very high functioning is they make purging, uh, you know, a non-negotiable. They don't purge for a year and a half. And then, you know, something really terrible happens in their life. And their purging starts coming back. And, of course, it scares them half to death. And they feel like they've regressed and they're going back to ground zero. Other than realizing that, you know, lapsing is part of recovery. Lapsing is part of recovery. And I've not met a client who hasn't lapsed that I've treated. And so don't get too scared. Let's just go back and know that I'm here, I'm available, and I'm going to help you through this. Uh, and to the point where you get to where you were before. If you made it non-negotiable before, you can make it non-negotiable again. Now, these comorbid disorders that go with it are real bears. So sometimes, you know, the person is just so damn depressed or they're flooded with an anxiety disorder. It's estimated that about 35% of anorexics um, have a premorbid diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and that, you know, a good 60 to 70 percent of anorexic have obsessional traits. And so, you know, working with obsessive compulsive disorder, you know, is a, you know, it involves two components. One is, you know, the ability to do exposure-based therapies and do hierarchies, and, you know, that's absolutely necessary. But also, if you think about the development of obsessive compulsive disorder, it comes into being because the person is terrified and afraid and they're avoiding something, and they, they, they catch on to this thing that works for them by counting or by obsessing about something. It prevents them from dealing with something that is just overwhelming and terrifying for them. And so what we're doing is by beginning to get the obsessive traits under control, they have to begin to deal with what it is that they're most afraid of. And that gets us to the concept of complex trauma. I think most of you probably have followed the literature on this in the last DSM, but, you know, the various studies that have been done, which, you know, has collected some incredible research on complex trauma, is this that there's this endemic part of the population that have had three or more severe traumas in their life that don't mount up to PTSD trauma. And, wow, that's so interesting because what you find is that each of our clients have these events that have occurred in their lives that have been overwhelming for them. Let me give you an example. One of my clients was 13 years old, and she and her friend were looking at pornography on the computer. And her friend went home and told her mother, and her mother said, you're not allowed to associate with this girl anymore. So the next day, she went into the lunchroom at school, and the girlfriend, her best friend, said, my mom says I'm not allowed to associate with you anymore. She got up and left the lunch table. And she told everybody else what happened, and everybody else got up and left the lunch table, leaving her to eat by herself. The whole rest of the year, when she was 13, she had to eat by herself at the lunch table. Now, how traumatic is that? She's now 26 years old. She's in my office. And when she's talking about it, she it regresses back to being a 13-year-old again. She hasn't worked through it at all. She told her parents. Her parents said, you'll get over it. And uh, she didn't get over it. And it was as traumatizing to her as just about anything I, I've ever seen. And you know, that's complex trauma. It's also PTSD trauma. And uh, we had to do a ton of work around that in order for her to not hate herself, which is, you know, the principal symptom you see in these obsessive kinds of patterns. So not only do you deal with the obsessive traits that develop as a result of that, but behind it oftentimes are these complex traumas that somehow we have minimized because, you know, this happens to all kids, but it doesn't happen to all kids. And, you know, there's lots of these things that happen. Divorce is a great example. You know, divorce is endemic. Step parenting is endemic. But you know, going to live in your dad, girl, dad's girlfriend's house can be incredibly traumatic for some people, and particularly for people who are very, very sensitive and reactive. And so even though they're normative, they can be incredibly overwhelming. And so, uh, so much of the work that you do in therapy uh, is around these complex traumas and they tend to keep the person from being able to recover, so it becomes necessary work. So the way I do it with my clients is I say, look, I know you want to do this work. 
You earn the right to do this work by getting under control of your out-of-control behavior. Once you get under control of your out-of-control behavior, we can get back and doing these deep work. So in a program like we're talking about, where we're an IOP or a PHP, what I can do is I can help them get under control of the symptom, and then I can get down to some of the deeper work. When I was doing outpatient therapy, sometimes I'd be working with them for two years trying to get the addictive behavior under control, and we'd never get down to doing the deeper work of the past trauma and neglect that was absolutely necessary for them to recover. So, you know, the treatment went on and on and on and on. And it's a catch-22. They can't give up the symptom until you do the trauma work. You can't do the trauma work until they get under control of the symptom. And so in order to be able to do that, having these mass trials are important. And you say, well, isn't that what they're supposed to do in residential treatment? And the answer is yes. I mean, we would love to do that. But oftentimes, you know, managed care would give us just a limited amount of time to do refeeding. And, you know, to get them to a 90% refeeding with the anorexic, you know, took almost all the time we had, and then the insurance company would say discharge them. So, you know, then you send them back to the outpatient therapist. They lose all the weight that they gained in a very quick period of time. We're back at ground zero where they never get a chance to do the work that they need to do to get better. I know you know all this, but, you know, it's insane. And so what we needed to do is reconceptualize, and that's sort of where this piece is that I'm doing now, which is I'm trying really hard to do some of this deeper work while the patient's being held and being under control. So we're working on the symptom simultaneously to working on these deeper issues that, you know, are the functions of the symptom in some way. And, you know, what clearly happens is that this all gets fueled by their verbalizations internally and their own self-hatred. And so we're going to do cognitive behavioral therapy. We're going to work on their, their cognitions that then affect their affect, which then affect their behavior. So one, day, one hour a day, I'm going to do CBT work around thoughts, feelings, and behaviors and challenging their core beliefs and doing schema work and all that structural stuff. One hour a day, I'm going to do relapse prevention and keeping them under control. Um, and then in... While we then can hold the symptom, then in individual therapy, you know, which we do four times a week, we really get down to the deeper work and help them be able to hit that end too. So I really find this a, an incredibly robust model. And, you know, it's supposed to be what happens in step-down programs in residential settings. But, you know, it, it's not what happens, unfortunately, in the vast majority of the programs. And, you know, you, you really got to have the best therapist working on these deeper issues because, you know, you all know doing this trauma work can be very delicate uh, and takes a tremendous amount of skill. And um, oftentimes these residential programs, you know, put their very best therapist on the inpatient end so they can get the behavior under control and put the younger therapist in the, in the IOP. Certainly we did in my previous program and it probably was a mistake. Okay, now you probably are thinking to yourself, well, I like everything Mark is saying but he doesn't seem to be talking much about affect. And isn't affect regulation one of the things that you're missing in your talk here? That they don't have the ability to experience emotions, to express emotions, to cope with and do affect tolerance. And the answer is yes. That Marsha Linehan is absolutely right. That um, whether it be borderline personality disorder or any of the personality disorders, the key aspect is affect tolerance, affect expression, and being able to hold affect and express affect without moving back into relapse. And so um, that it's really important to begin to use the group process to be able to help people begin to identify their emotions and feelings and be able to express them in some, in some way. And so the third group that's essential is a DBT group. So just to review, we're going to do relapse prevention group, we're going to do DBT group, and then we're going to do the ABC group. Where we, in the ABC group, we look at cognitions, affect, and behavior, and looking at challenging their, um, their thought patterns and beginning to work with them on beginning to uh, work on self-hatred uh, and uh, to challenge their self-hatred on a daily basis and also to give positive affirmations. Okay, so let's take a breath. I know I've said a lot so far. But I want to get the whole picture here. I want to lay out the components of treatment, and that's what I'm trying to be able to do. Now, the next thing that you're saying is, okay, I like what you're saying. Everything makes sense. 
But what about this family work? Because for so many of the clients, they're not going to get better until the family gets better. I had a great example of this. I was working with a, a woman, and I did everything just the way I, I was doing really good work. And I, everything was exactly the way it should have been. But the client refused to follow her meal plan. And so, you know, I was about ready to fire her or fire myself. And I was desperate. So in my desperateness, I, I called up her father on the phone. I said, you know, I, I'm not helping your daughter, and I'm sorry. But the one thing she mentioned is that you and she were once close when she was younger, and the two of you don't talk now. So I'm wondering if there might be something there. So would you mind coming down for a week or so and let me do some work with the two of you and just see if I can do this. I just, you know, I can't promise you, but it's the only way I, I know how to go. So he showed up and he sat down in my office alone and he looked at me and he started to cry. And his face hit the ground and he said, Mark, i got to tell you something I never told anybody before. He said, when I was about 20 years old, I was driving in a car, drunk, and I hit a girl, a young girl, and I killed her. And they sent me to jail for it. And I was in jail for a period of time. And I've not really talked about this with anybody. And I think what happened was when my daughter got to the age of the girl that I killed, I think I pulled back out of shame. And, you know, I think that maybe it's my fault that she's here today. Well, you know, there it was, right there on my table, you know, like right in front of me. And I thought to myself, you know, no wonder, no wonder, no wonder. And we all know this, that these things get passed down the generational line. Something the grandmother did, something the mother, something that happened. So anything that's unfinished in a previous generation oftentimes is left to the next generation to complete and finish in some way. You know, it, there were times in my residential treatment where 40% of the clients that I had had grandparents who were Holocaust survivors, and the clients were anorexic. And that can be no coincidence, right? So the, what am I missing here? The intergenerational component. And so there it was in front of me. And so, you know, because PTSD is my specialty, I work with this guy you know, for a week, and, you know, being in an in, inpatient program allows you to have the ability to do that. And I worked with him for two hours a day, and we did some incredible work, and then at the end of this week, you know, we called the daughter in, and he said, look, you know, there's something i got to tell you. And he started to cry, and he told the daughter the story, and the daughter started to cry, and they held each other and hugged each other for like 45 minutes in my office, and then we began to do the work. And, you know, I don't, you know, I know that sounds sort of fairy tale-ish, but I tell you, that 45 minutes of them crying together was what was essential for this girl to recover. And, you know, soon after he left, you know, she started following her meal plan and everything went according to normal treatment. But I needed to do that piece of work first, clearly. Next thing I did, believe it or not, was we brought his wife in because she wanted to divorce him. And so I had to work with he and his wife in order to repair their relationship once that the, you know, it was out in some way. And, of course, that's it. Once you open these things up, they're yours, and you've got to do the whole piece. And so, you know, I'm a marital therapist, I'm a trauma therapist, I'm an eating disorder therapist, and, you know, it takes an enormous amount of skills to be able to do all these components uh, and do them effectively, and you've got to know one piece to be able to do the other piece. So the key thing, then, is understanding the function of these symptoms and understanding that the whole family is your identified client and what one has to do is to be able to be open to doing whatever is necessary within the family environment. Yes, you can refer the family out, but you can't always be sure that it's going to do the work. But if I've got a client who's dying in, you know, in my residential treatment center, the parents are going to be much more motivated to want to resolve their own stuff. And so, yeah, I'm not doing residential anymore. I'm doing the next step. But because so much of this family work has never been done within the residential setting, you know, and it's really hard to get it, this into a, you know, an outpatient practice. Doing this in the IOP, PHP kind of setting makes all the sense in the world, and that becomes a primary goal. And not everybody has these uh, generational issues, but honestly, I find that doing family of origin work is essential in almost every case. If the parents are alive, there's just a lot of work to do. And oftentimes you have to help the parents do their own work before they're ready to be able to do the family work. And you have to be able to do both in some ways. Okay, now, the next thing I want to talk about 
is helping a person have an identity. I know this is a highly complex area, and it's theoretically been very unclear, but you know, I'm a person who's been mostly influenced by Cohut and Winnicott. I'm a self-psychologist by training, and I, I love Winnicott. I love Cohut. I go back and read them all the time, and I just find they're as rich today as they always were. I also like Masterson, you know, Disorders of Self. You know, th these people were geniuses, and they have so much to say, and I think a lot of us have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So, you know, if you get a chance somewhere along the way, I recommend you go back and reread some of these basic texts because they speak to you very loudly around this issue, particularly of identity. And that, you know, what Cohead always said is that we're looking for mirrors every day. One of my clients said to me, you know, Mark, I looked in the mirror today and I saw myself for the first time. And she said this to me as she was walking down the hallway. And I grabbed her and I said, wait a minute, what the hell did you just say? And tell me what the hell it meant. And she said, well, every time I look in the mirror, what I saw was an image of what I looked like when I was in high school, when I was obese. And today, when I looked in the mirror, I saw what I look like now, and I'm not obese. Now, what does that mean? I said, well, you know, in my previous incarnation, I was a trauma therapist. And for, to understand work with trauma, you have to understand dissociative disorder. This woman had a dissociative disorder. What she saw in the mirror was not the actual image that was in the mirror. Now, I'm a specialist in dissociative disorder. Why didn't I see that? I said. <laughs> and then I said, you know, body dysmorphia is a dissociative disorder. So I started looking at all the research and all the books on body dysmorphic disorder, but no one is naming body dysmorphic disorder, a dissociative disorder. You know, it's like, hello, there's an elephant in the living room here. What do we know about dissociative disorders? Dissociative disorders means a part of you hijacks your eyes and you see things that aren't there. Uh, that's what I'm seeing every day. So the key in understanding these disorders of self is to understand that there are parts of self that take over hijack the eyes, and are controlling. And so, you know, there's a recalcitrant adolescent part that's running the show rather than the self. And so all my clients were telling me this. I just wasn't listening. They were saying, I don't know who I am. I don't have a sense of self. If you take my eating disorder away, who am I? The only thing I know is I'm an anorexic. And I'm a bulimic. And I'm a, I'm a, a little reader. And that's who I am. If you take that away, I don't know who I am. And that's why, you know, so many people who get these surgeries, you know, you're taking their identity away and they're, it's like, you know, sending them out of an airplane without a parachute. They don't know who they are. They feel confused in some way. And so what I went back to was to understand the adult attachment interview. In the adult att attachment interview, what Mary Main said is that a person had to have a cohesive, coherent, collaborative narrative in order to have a secure attachment. Now, what she realized there is that to have a cohesive narrative, you have to put the pieces of your life together in a cohesive way, in a coherent way. And it has to make sense. Two and two has to always equal four. And that's the key to dissociation, is that, you know, your life becomes fragmented, and it, the beginning doesn't relate to the end in some ways. And, you know, so many other kinds of say, why do you have this eating disorder? They don't have a clue. They're not able to tell you developmentally. So some part of the work has to go back and beginning to look at what happened when there were two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. It's a developmental disorder. And in a developmental disorder, there are structural deficits that occur at those ages. Now, who talks about that? There's a guy named Stanley Greenspan. Stanley Greenspan at NIH works with children, and he wrote a book called, you know, Structural Deficits um, That are part of psychotherapy. And in those structural deficits, what he identified is that at four years old, six years old, and eight year old, if you don't get just the right kinds of input into your brain, you are going to have develop these structural deficits that will result in executive function disorders. Ah, that's it. So they have these deficits and they still feel, some part of them still feels like they're six years old, eight years old, 
10 years old, and so on. And so a disorder of self is beginning to take the parts of self that have become um, la a lack of integration, a lack of connection, and begin to put them together. And when these parts come together, you have identity. You have the sense of self. If the parts don't come together, then the person never gets a chance to grow up. And so they remain with adolescent executive functions in some way. So you can take the executive functions, but there has to be a receptor site for them too, and that comes from having a coherent, cohesive, collaborative narrative. And so we work a lot on narratives, and people are working on beginning to differentiate the self and self from others, and work on you know a lot of these functions that 12, 13, 14-year-olds are able to do in some ways. And we do this in a structural kind of way. Okay, so just to kind of say something about that to finish off this section. You know, Masterson and others would talk about a false self. A false self is highly compliant, approval-seeking. One of my clients came in last night, and she went out on a date, and she couldn't say no to the guy. She couldn't, when, he, when she wanted to go home, she couldn't go home. When she wanted him to stop touching him, she couldn't say no to touching him. She shouldn't have been out on that date because without the ability to say no, she was going to get re-victimized. Then her mother called her on the phone for Mother's Day and her mother talked to her for an hour and 45 minutes and she couldn't get off the phone with her mother because she couldn't say no. Now, could it be that some people can't say yes and they can't say no? That those functions have been taken away from them because when they were younger, all the decisions were made to them by their parents and they didn't feel like they had the will to be able to say no or maybe they were sexually abused and when they said no, no one listened to them, or some other horrible thing like that. The capacity to say no is injured. We call that a self-function. And self-functions are for the individual to be able to operate in the world effectively. And so many of the clients are at 12 to 15 year old levels on self-function. And so have this person go out and do dating if they don't know how to be able to say no. Now how do you teach a person to say no? If you're a cognitive behavioral therapist, you say, well, maybe you want to do that. Or maybe you think you want to say no by giving them a certain training. Or maybe you want to do psychodrama with them. I don't find any of that very helpful. I've done all that. I've tried it. And it's not been very, very successful. The only way I've been able to help people do self-functions is to begin to deal with the complex trauma. And so some part of them has to be able <coughs> to resolve what happened to them when we were 12, 13, that, you know, got, that got them stuck in some way and get them unstuck. And so I think that's where the deeper work comes in. So if their mother died when they were age 12 or if they were sexually abused when they were age 6, one has to do work around the PTSD or the complex trauma. And then so much of that trauma work is around cognitive-based therapies, which is back then someone told, stole the ability to say no and we're going to give that back in some way. And so... Obviously, a self-function um, requires two components. One is to find out what happened that got the person stuck back then. And then two, how to be able to have the new skills to be able to do it now. So doing the, the trauma work is necessary but not sufficient. Doing the cognitive behavioral work is necessary but not sufficient. But you have to do both of them that are critical. In the meantime, they can't be outdating. They need to be abstaining from that until they develop the ability to be able to do that. How important is that? Because if you get them to go too fast and think, well, dating and sex are an important part of recovery before they're ready to do it, you end up re-victimizing them, iatrogenically setting them up to relapse. And, of course, we were doing that for a long time in an inpatient program because we really didn't understand just how limited they were in their real world. In an inpatient program, you only see as much as you can see that they show you on a day-by-day -day basis. But when you're actually with them in the world and you're seeing them day in and day out, and how they interact with other people, how they go to work, school, how they work, you get to be able to see that in a much more effective way. It's more robust. So a lot of it is beginning to work with that. In your handouts, I have something called the prime directive, which are these core beliefs that people operate by. One of them is don't disappoint others. Two would be be perfect. Three is don't experience pleasure. Four is don't break the rules. Five is keep your parents idealized. Six is quickly find issues for others, but not for yourself. Codependency. 
Next is restrict in all arenas of your life. Seven is no spontaneity. And eight would be avoid mourning at all costs. And I give this list to them and I have them put up in the mirror and these are the prime directives. Because as long as they keep operating by these prime directives, they need to have their eating disorder. And so what I'm trying to say to them is let's not just focus on food or food related behavior, but let's focus on these prime directives rather than just the eating disorder. And understand that your goal this week is to work on perfectionism, not just on food. Because, you know, so many of my clients will say to me, just tell me what to do to recover. Tell me what you want me to do this week and I'll do it. I just don't know what to do to get what, what I want in some way. And so uh, I have to point out to them what's going to be necessary for them. Now, the final thing I want to say about identity is that if you have been exposed to Richard Schwartz's work, I recommend that you read his little book that he's written on uh, the self. Because, you know, he's brilliant. He's wonderful. And what he has to say is, you know, really revolutionary. And even if you don't do internal family systems therapy, the, the concept of self is, is ingenious. And basically what he says in a sentence is that we're born with a sense of self. And that what happens is, is that as we get older, it's stolen from us by what he calls protectors. And so protectors say, you need to be perfect in order to be okay. You need to um, get out there and not trust people because they're going to hurt you. Um, protect yourself from people who love you because they're going to abandon you and hurt you in some way. And so on down the line. And so each time something horrible happens to you or somebody in your family, you get punished. And each time you get punished, that sense of self gets twisted and turned in some ways. And so what happens is that uh, the person becomes less and less themselves. And they become hijacked in some way. And so he defines eight C's of, of self, which is the ability to have curiosity, compassion, calmness, clarity, confidence, courage, creativity, and connectedness. I'll read that again. The eight C's of self are the ability to have curiosity, compassion, calm, clarity. They're all concepts that you're born with. Confidence, courage, creativity, and connectedness. And for my clients, it's really helpful for them to have a map of what it means to be in self and what it means to have a false self. And the eating disorder is a false self. So one of my clients last night went out to, on a date with a man and she went out to dinner with him and she took a guest. She took her eating disorder to dinner with her. And she focused on her eating disorder rather than on the man. And it wasn't a particularly good day. So if she could leave her eating disorder at home rather than taking the eating disorder on the date with her, that would be terrific. We had to teach her how to be able to do that. It's not something you just know how to do. So as we got to know the eating disorder parts of self, we were able then to get them to be able literally to stay at home while she went out on this date. And then she, we were able to help her be in self on the date, which is what it is that the goal was. Not The goal was not to get the guy to like her. The goal was to help her be able to leave her eating disorder at home and be in self on the date. When she understood that, um, we were able to be fairly directive on whatever it is that she needed to do. So we were trying to get the true self to be able to expose itself. And as we exposed her to the, re to the real self, she liked it and it became more part of who she is in some ways. Okay, so... What I wrote out then next in your handouts, and for those of you who are dying with questions, um, I'm going to stop relatively soon and take your questions. But I want to just say a couple of final things, which was there's some interesting research on looking at eating disorder patients who recover and asking them, you know, what were the key aspects of your recovery? And I want you to listen to what they say and see how it relates to what I've said so far. These are empirical criteria that, it, that recovered clients document as key to their recovery. One, part, one, one characteristic is improvement in self-care, leisure time, eating habits, and so on. New ways to self-soothe and self-regulate. The ability to access social support from family, friends, and fellow clients. Enhance problem-solving skills. Improve capacity to invest in and work on interpersonal relationships. 
gradual relinquishment of the eating disorder identity. The ability to take responsibility for self and get out of the victim mentality. Establishing a sense of true self, real me, knowing who I am. Capacity to formulate goals and maintain positive motivation to carry out these goals. Reclamation of a sense of one's personal power. Decreased emphasis on perfectionism. Firmer interpersonal boundaries and the cultivation of a sense of purpose and meaning for life. Now, those criteria are exactly what I've been saying. I read that literature and I thought, oh, this makes good sense. And, you know, then I filed the article away. But it never really helped me in figuring out what to do with the clients day in, day out, in order to be able to reach those goals. But now, those very criteria are what inform me. What I do every hour in my therapy session, what I do every hour in my group, is I work on those goals. And what I used to do was treat the eating disorder. I worked on food and food-related behaviors. And now what I realize is that it was a little bit um, necessary because, you know, a person's not going to benefit from psychotherapy when they're, you know, when they're 60 pounds and when they're purging three times a day. I know that. So it's a, the first stage is to get them relatively under control. But then you have to quickly move to the second mode of therapy, which is instead of just focusing on food-related behavior. But so many of my colleagues, you know, they read the books on how you treat eating disorder, and so much of the emphasis of the session is just on food-related behavior. And now that I've identified, here are the 10 goals that we have in treatment, and we're going to work on them simultaneously and sequentially, it's, you know, the therapy is much more directed, and the client knows what their assignments are, and the therapist knows what it is that they need to be working on, and it's laid out in a structural kind of way, uh, hopefully for the person. All right. If we have time, I'm going to talk a little bit about intimacy and relationships and sexuality, but I think I'll hold that maybe to another a webinar um, if we don't have time. I think I'd rather spend this time, you know, seeing what you all think about what I've said so far and whether I've spoken to you and whether you have any thoughts or questions that you'd like me to answer. So, Victor, you want to come back in and help mediate this a little bit? Yeah, wonderful, Mark. Uh, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, fine. Okay, great. Uh, we've had a number of questions come in here, and I was going to combine two of them because they're sort of related in a manner of speaking. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that up. Okay. I think both of these are really, really crucial. Uh, Sarah asked, uh, what happens if one of the parents is not willing to do their work? And Kesha asked, in your opinion, does everyone who suffers with an eating disorder suffer with PTSD as well? I was thinking that both of those questions kind of really, uh, you answer them before, but maybe you can expand on it a little bit more. I mean, if the parents are not willing to do their work, and if someone has eating yes. disorder, do they also have PTSD? Okay. Well, you know, that's a good question. And it, it depends on what their work means. I mean, so many of the clients want their parents to change. And the goal is not for the parents to change. The goal is to be able to have some interchange between the client and the parents so that the, whatever the issues are, they become salient. And you as a therapist are a witness and an ally to that process. And so all I want to be able to do is, you know, I'll see the parent and I'll engage them in some individual process. They'll trust me. They'll feel safe. And I try to open them up. And I try to engage them in a process, just like any other identified client. And I'll, I'm very successful. I mean, you know, the vast majority of parents I'm able to engage in that process, um, particularly because their daughter or son is in trouble. And, you know, at some level their conscience is saying, I feel guilty about it. But they feel so guilty that they won't come into therapy because they think you're going to blame them in some way. And so if you can really address that on the front end and get them out of the blame game, you know, the first thing I say to a client is you didn't cause your 
daughter or son's eating disorder. We are not going to blame you. They're not going to blame you. That's not what this is about. And for, if you want to help your daughter or son, which I assume you do because you're here, then the first thing you have to deal with is whatever you're feeling in terms of feeling guilty. Because your guilt can only make them feel worse. And I start with that premise. And then we work on that right from the very beginning. And then I do a developmental history with them so they become an identified client. And then they begin to see I have something to offer them to help them, that I care about them, not just the daughter or son, and I can engage them in that process. And so, you know, I, I'm pretty seductive in that way, and I, I want to be in the sense of, because they're so scared and they feel so guilty, that's what's blocking them from being able to do their work. Now, that be said, you know, there's a high percentage of parents that I can't get to, and yet the client feels like that process of being able to to deal with them has been good. One set of parents, we did this incredible therapy over a couple of days, and then the day they left, they went back and they repeated some of the same old stuff they had said before, word for word for word. And the identified client said, to me, you know, it was all a waste of time. And I said, oh, you are so wrong. You are just so, so wrong. And, you know, here's what I saw in front of my eyes. And we went through it piece by piece by piece, word by word, sentence by sentence. And I validated that which we saw. And we validated the invalidation of when should they left. And then over the next six months, the parents completely changed and um, stopped doing that which I asked them to be able to stop doing in this therapy session. So we began a process that's not going to happen overnight it, that will happen over time. So I really am a firm believer that that um, the system is going to change. It's not going to just change overnight. Is there PTSD? There's complex trauma, PTSD, and neglect in the vast majority of cases, but it's true endemic in the population. So our clients are like the rest of the population. And yes, developmental trauma means that we have to deal sequentially with the events that have occurred in their life that have contributed to it. Have I ever seen a client who does not have trauma? Or, or complex trauma or some neglect in their life? Um, yes, I have. I've seen some who've come from incredibly healthy families and um, the, it feels much more on the genetic side. And, um, uh, you know, there are genes that predispose this, there are predispositions. And, you know, there, these are kids that oftentimes in the first five years of life had food and eating kinds of problems, were hypersensitive, had trouble going to school. You know, and it's a different kind of disorder, but that's a different kind of syndrome. It probably requires a different kind of treatment. Victor? Great. We've had a, a couple more questions come in. And uh, what I was going to do was uh, take a moment here. Okay, so here's the question. From Jill, do all clients who come to Harmony get to have sessions with you, Mark? Or all... Are all Therapists week. trained in IFS and legacy burdens. That's such a nice thing to say. Thank you. I'd give you a big hug if, I, if you were here. Lori and I do all the work. Uh, you know, those of you who don't know Lori, she's my partner for the last 28 years. And she do things I can't do and I can do things she can't do. We both do group every day and we both see the clients ourselves. We only see about seven clients at a time at the most. So, you know, I see three a day and she says four or vice versa. And so if the same person doing the individual therapy is doing the group, it works so much better. So we've got really small and that's what we're about. We're, you know, we, we got big. In my old incarnation, we had 150 employees and um, it got too big for us. And we just decided to get small again and uh, we do much better work. Let me just tell people to come out and visit us in Monterey at any time. We welcome guests, and uh, there are seal out here. Baby seals are being created as we speak, and uh, it's just a beautiful, extraordinary place. Our place sits on the ocean uh, in Cannery Row, and uh, we're, we have sessions right on the water. It's just wonderful. I know you're all angry now. It's like, that's not fair. No, no, let's have you do it again.
uh, because uh, I missed the first uh, five seconds. If you could just say that again, I think it's really important. See, I think here's something I think a lot of people don't realize is you've, you're, you're a celebrity and an expert, which is one of the highest authority, you know, levels that you can achieve. And you've gone from, as you said, 100 employees servicing thousands and thousands of people, realizing that that individual attention is really what matters, that you can actually serve people uh, in a bigger way through their transformation by, by uh, taking on fewer clients uh, that are more committed to transformation. And I think a lot of people don't realize, you know, the sacrifice and the benefit that they receive uh, through this transformational work that you do. So uh, what's, uh, what I'd love you to do is to maybe just speak to that. Okay, so, all right, so the issue to me was that, you know, I saw what was happening in the field, which was that you know these big companies were buying up all the treatment centers, and they were becoming more business-like, and I didn't like it. You know, we were a mom and pop shop, and whenever we'd stop being a mom and pop shop, it the quality went down. So, you know, I, I dropped out of that and decided to get back to what I think is important. I, most people in the eating disorder field know what's important, which is your relationship with the client is what helps them get better. Your loving and caring for the client is what causes the recovery to be successful. And when you get to the point where you're too big, you can't have that. And so, you know, I'm really wedded to this idea of never getting bigger than having, you know, five to seven clients and really giving them everything you've got, you know, for a period of time. And uh, this, it's, this disease is a horrible one. I also decided that working with just eating disorder alone was not sufficient because almost all my clients had comorbid addictions and psychiatric disorders. A lot of them were bipolar and uh, weren't even properly regulated for that. And a lot of them had alcohol and drug abuse or turned to alcohol and drug abuse. So it wasn't unusual for us to have a heroin addict who also had an eating disorder. And you know, in CD programs, as soon as they get the CD under control, the eating disorder gets big. So what we have to do is treat the comorbid addictions too. So, you know, we've started treating chemical dependency, heroin addiction, along with eating disorder. And honestly, um, heroin is addiction oftentimes is easier to treat than anorexia. So uh, putting them together is really very, very helpful. So I'm looking for the, the client that has multiple addictions because going to different treatment centers is not a good idea. Having one place that works with all of them is really ideal. Uh, so there was a question asked uh, about the age of people treated at Harmony Place. Uh, what ages do you treat? We don't treat young children. We treat adolescents and adults. So what would be the cutoff on the early side? It really depends on their, their maturity. I don't want to re-victimize a child. So their capacity to be able to be with adults. And, you know, some of them are much more capable than others. But, you know, usually about 15 is the cutoff. Okay, we're having some, like, raving comments here. Thank you for shining a light in the dark. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of these right here and acknowledge some people. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, C.S. Davis, about uh, your, your beautiful comments about shining a light in the dark. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wonderful information. One thing, One thing I talk didn't talk about that I want to just mention is we're doing a lot of Buddhist tradition kind of work. You know, I've been greatly influenced by the Buddhist tradition. And in meditation in particular, but you know, the whole concept of love and kindness and the Buddhist tradition. And I find that, you know, that the mindfulness work that's being done now, you know, that Linehan probably has much more to do with than anybody. Um, and then Hayes's work on acceptance therapy and all that business. And then just learning meditation. So every morning I start out with, you know, with meditation. We're also doing a lot of body work. We're doing somatosensory kind of work and 
some of the work that's being done, you know, getting off the chair and moving your body, either in expressive therapies or in, in uh, somatosensory therapy, turns out to be really essential, teaching people how to be in their bodies for body dysmorphia. Because about a third of our clients have body dysmorphic disorder, and that has to be treated, so, you know, completely independently of the eating disorder. Okay, another question came in uh, from Aida Sanchez Nunez. She asks, do you ever do online psychotherapy for eating disorders? Yeah, we do. Particularly, you know, a lot of our clients come from outside of state. So we do this work here, and then from there we follow them up by Skype and, you know, work adjunctively with their therapist because, you know, they oftentimes, you know, they, they need to see a local therapist, but we keep them on course. And um, so, yeah, you know, a couple hours a day I'm on Skype. Okay, and uh, Kesha Johnson Scott asks, uh, do we get CEUs for this webinar? Yeah, particularly here in California, because we have, you know, we're a CEU provider in California for MFTs and, and, and social workers, but um, that certificate is probably usable in, in other areas. And we'll send you a certificate. In the mail? Yes, we'll, we'll mail it to you. If anybody out there has done similar work to me, and is in the same track. I'd love to learn from you. So I'd love to start some sort of correspondence. I mean, obviously, I've just outlined the basics of what I do, but I, I, I'm learning fast, and I read everything I can get my hands on. And if those of you have things that have influenced you or have ideas, I'd love to dialogue with you. Yeah. Okay. So, someone, uh, Jackie says, "Thank you for the focus on recovery, not just being about refeeding." I run an IOP, and the insurance is tying our hands most of the time. We don't find that our, our insurance companies have been very generous with IOP, and um, they really uh, support us enormously. And we've had some people, and in, in, you know, actually, I think more than not, we've stopped treatment before the insurance company did. So. You know, IOP is, you know, the way that they save money because residential treatment is so costly. So uh, it's reasonable, and it, it's a reasonable alternative. How do most eating disorder clients come to treatment? Family members are the ones that call the red flat, or do you find those and the disorder actually take the initiative to seek help? Both, and 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 usually they, the, uh, most of our referrals are from professionals. So they, the, most of the people have been in therapy before, but you know I think in their desperate moments they go on the web and they try to see what's available in some cases. But I, I don't know systematically. We haven't really followed that. Uh, Bertine asked, "Are you done going on the road to do seminars and presentations?" <laughs> no, I I go on the road still. I I'm going to be on the road later this afternoon, and then I I'm doing workshops around the country still. So you can check my website, and I, I'm still um I, I have cut back, and I'm trying to only do it maybe twice a month, but I, I've been averaging that. Okay, that's wonderful. And uh, Julie says, uh, can I make a referral for you? I'm a social worker in Monterey County working with adolescents with eating disorder, physical and sexual abuse, PTSD from their parents' addictions. What, what would be the best way for them to reach you? Uh, would that be the office email address? Or, uh, That'd be the best way, but probably the best way would be come have coffee with me. Come have okay. coffee in Cannery Row. <laughs> I like I like to get to know my neighbors. Yeah, so Julie, uh, you, you've got a coffee date here. I believe the Thank phone you. number that uh, that is uh, eight three one seven four seven one seven two seven. Is that correct? Right. It is interesting, the general opinion is that only eating disorders are anorexia, binging, and purging. 
And then someone said, I also love the idea of taking clients out of the office. We frequently do social activities like miniature golf just to have fun and practice being in a social group. Well, it's necessary and essential, but our ethical boards would have some issue with it. So that's the dilemma with being a licensed professional. And so I use... Uh, life coaches to be able to do that, who oftentimes are recovered individuals, uh, which prevent, you know, gives them some, you know, part of recovery is helping other people. So a lot of the people who have recovered come back and work with me and help other clients. And that really is a wonderful way of doing treatment because it gives them some hope it, that they too can recover. So, you know, almost all my recovered clients come back and work with me. And miniature golf is a good one. These meetup groups are awesome. I love them. There's hundreds of them in the area. Okay, so uh, we have about 15 minutes uh, left at the top of the hour, and I was thinking that if anyone wants to come in on audio and engage in a banter with Mark, uh, we could do that. I like to finish off my events. Sometimes it brings a sense of community to it. Uh, if any of you have a headset, uh, just just say yes in the chat box. Actually, let, let's do it this way. If you got some value from tonight, I'd like you to write yes in the chat box below or if you're watching the replay. Uh, just share what insights you gained in this uh, in the chat box below or in the live fire feed uh, that will be appearing on the replay. Uh, so that this can be shared on social media. Folks, we really need your support in spreading the word about this great resource that Mark is providing through Harmony Place in Monterey. And if anyone would like to come in on audio, let me know in the chat below and we'll bring you on uh, in the uh, remaining time that we have with Mark before you got to hit, uh, hit the road and get on a plane. Victor, let me make a summary statement. Let me do a summary statement, which is the last four slides, I try to put out a cookbook for you. In this cookbook, I just laid out the stages of treatment. And so the first stage of treatment is relapse prevention, which is getting people under control, identifying their triggers, and doing the work that we typically do in residential treatment. Second stage of treatment is skills building, learning skills to protect oneself, to feel safe in the world, to interact effectively in the world, um, and stabilization. The third stage is called education and there what we're doing is dealing with them with shame, mapping out the stages of recovery, um, exploring spirituality, um, and beginning to talk about these concepts we're talking about today of self exposure uh, and being able to feel a sense of effectiveness and power in operating in the world. The middle stage um, is then beginning to deal with intense emotions, doing grief work. Um, there we might do EMDR, uh, varieties of work around internal family systems, affect-based kinds of therapies, um, codependency work, family of origin work, and so on. Um, and then the final stage is I run three groups. And in these groups are recovered groups that are kind of um, people who have recovered but now we're following them up for two years following that on a once a week basis and these recovery groups just helping them begin to deal with life's problems without turning back to their eating disorder and give each other support and love uh, in the process and you know I, I find that even people who have recovered and have been a, you know not moved, used their eating disorder for a year or two they suddenly go back to it and they have a period of time where they 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 slip and then I'm, I'm going to grab them when they slip and pull, pull them back and put them back uh, functioning again. So uh, it's, it's not uncommon. And the, they're, they're understanding that these slips are part of the recovery process uh, and uh, that we're going to be there to be able to catch it. Even if they leave, it's good that they know that they have all these resources of you know, eight to ten other people who are in group that are really available to them on an ongoing basis. And so in that way, it becomes like AA, but you know, it's a therapist-led AA, which I, I'm more in favor of. 
Hi there. I know Mark. I've seen him present before. I've loved this presentation. I'm going to be teaching a class uh, in an eating disorder certificate program on in relapse recovery and recurrence. So there's some great insights in here, Mark. Thank you. Thank I you, really Jeff. appreciate it. I really appreciate it. I really, the thing I really enjoyed the most is this idea that I think it's true that most people think recovery is just about the food. And I, and I know it's, a, and I know you know this too, everybody else in the group probably knows that too, it's about so much of the rest of it. But I love the tools that you gave us to help us kind of, kind of peel that onion. That's been very, very helpful. And I, it was, I just have somebody else, I know I know it too, but you put it into the words so I don't have to. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome, Jackie. Mark, this is Suzanne. No I just problem. want to comment on uh, on uh, how much I I love your focus on on the actual symptoms and causes of the addiction or the eating disorder behavior versus so much of what I've 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 witnessed in the addiction recovery field is just to stop the behavior. And that really leaves, I think, a lot of stress and white knuckling to try and stop the behavior without getting down to the actual origins of the of the uh, of the disorders themselves. I just I loved your approach on that and what you're doing at Harmony Place. Thank you. Yeah, I think that holistic approach is essential and really come to age. And you know, too many of the addiction programs, you know, become insurance focused, which is you know that you just relieve the symptom or you're being ineffective and sometimes the symptom isn't ready to be relieved. You've got to understand the context and the function of the symptom and it can be sometimes dangerous to take a symptom away without understanding its function because sometimes it's the only voice a person has to be able to say that what's on the outside doesn't match what's going on, on the inside and my life's totally out of control and I can't live in this world. Yes. Beautiful. Wow, that's a huge statement. Mark, this Thank is you. Bertine Loop calling from, or rather talking from Lincoln, Nebraska. I first heard you about 20 years ago on a forensic unit in Lincoln, speaking uh, actually much to this issue you were talking at that time about a different uh, author. And I would just like to say, um, uh, too, about how much I appreciate the holistic approach. I try to do that and offer alternative therapies in my own practice, especially um, the um, food and nutrition, um, local foods movement organic foods and of course using the garden as a metaphor for wellness and that's completely what you talk about too. Thank you very much. We're getting old. <laughs> no, 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 no. If you think about it as perennials it goes a lot better. Uh, the soil is the, um, actually the, it's the year of the soil. So I love that. The soil. And you know it, it, the idea of being able to enjoy food and to nourish it and to let it nourish you uh, is such a good one. I, one of my friends wanted to open up a, a center where they, everybody would grow their own food and then eat it. And I always thought that was like the best idea. I have uh, my clients, uh, the families, we grow uh, and start seeds in containers and then they take the large containers home. and. It's very interesting that by the 4th of July, if you do a home-based session, you can really see who's oh. nurturing and who is not. Well, thank you for coming out this evening. Uh, depending upon where in, you are in the country, in the East Coast, it's already uh, around 6 o'clock Eastern Time. And you're in the Pacific Ocean. We're just about five minutes before concluding this webinar. And uh, thank you again for coming out. We will be, when, when will we do our next event and what's the topic approximately? We're not going to tie you to a date, but it's always good to announce the next event. What, what do you think? I think we talked about sexual addiction, uh, that you didn't have a chance to really go into that this time. Um, I think, you know, we'll certainly notify people by email, but do you think maybe two weeks or three weeks? How, how far out do you think we, we would do the next event? Mark. The next event I want to do is the attachment work where we're talking about, uh, it's the last part of this lecture, which is how to help people form secure attachment and taking the attachment literature and applying it to a clinical population and how you work with somebody who's got disorganized attachment and help them have secure attachment. I've talked about that before at conferences, but I feel like I mean, my knowledge base has actually increased dramatically in that 
And so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the fine tuning of what you do with people to help them be able to form safe connections with other people. Okay, great. And uh, when do you think uh, people would be able to, like, mid June, somewhere around there, Look early? Forward June? to that one. About a month. Okay. So uh, check your email for any uh, further updates on that, and we will uh, send out an announcement as soon as the dates are set for that next event. And uh, also watch your email for the replays of this event as soon as they're available. Uh, we will be posting them and sending them out to you. And uh, if you are watching this as a replay, please uh, click the share this on Facebook button and let people know about this event. We appreciate your support in helping spread the word about Harmony Place. I'm Victor Grant and I'm going to be ending the broadcast here. Thank you for attending. Take care.